Hey everyone, Merry Christmas! We are less than a week away from Christmas, which is super exciting. It's always my favorite time of the year. And I only have one more shop, one more time that I got to venture out into this crazy city I'm in. I'm sure it's crazy everywhere in the world at this time of year. Well, maybe not everywhere in the world. Where, wherever Christmas is celebrated, it's crazy. Let's just put it that way. So one more episode, though, before the year is over. And it's a doozy, ladies. I got to say, this one may rock your world pretty hard. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, Todd Ritchie, who is an addiction specialist. He was extremely instrumental in my own healing journey when I worked with him I'd say about eight years ago now and it just you know it changed the trajectory of my life I really think it did he he brought an awareness to me about my own addictions that I had no idea about and just has a really unique perspective on addiction so you're gonna want to grab the paper and pen for this one because there'll be a lot of stuff that you're gonna have to go back to you're gonna want to re-listen to this podcast possibly even a couple of times to really get it to sink into the old brain and I'll tell you what if you do it's one of these you know life transforming things that can happen when you really get what he's what he's putting in front of you so be open-minded, take a listen, and enjoy the podcast, and Merry Christmas. The female body has changed. It's not as easy to lose weight anymore. It's time we started looking beyond diet and exercise and began looking at the other side of weight loss. Welcome to the On Track Show. I am Karen Martell, certified transformational nutritionist and founder of the On Track Women's Weight Loss Program. Each week, I will share with you the secrets to conquering your health and weight loss. So today, my guest is very special, near and dear to me, and is a very powerful speaker, interventionist, <laughs> friend, your powerful friend. He is a celebrated... He is a celebrated addiction specialist and counselor, passionate international speaker, creator of the Neuro Alignment Model, and co-author of the Answer Model and the Answer Model Theory books. He has used the Neuro Alignment Model in his addiction counseling service, services for over 12 years to help people break out of the vast majority of their dysfunctional thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. Welcome, Todd Ritchie. Thank you so much, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm actually really honored to be able to share this with you today. I was just telling Todd before we got started that I've known for a long time that I was going to have him on the show. Todd was extremely instrumental in my own healing process many years ago I worked with him but he's also just a close and very dear family friend and has been for oh gosh probably over 20 years now I met him when I was 19 so over 20 years 23 years to be exact wow. I know right I was thinking about that last night and thinking geez how long have I known him and it's like well I know I met you on my 19th mm -hmm. birthday so there we go. I was, no at, I was the first time. time flies. I know, right? It was the first time I went to a bar and you drove us there. <laughs> How funny is that? No and then kidding. and then you're my addiction, you're my addiction specialist like 10 years later, right? No, more than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how the oh, world works. Hey Todd. <laughs> I, know, I know. I know. It's a magical place. <laughs> yes. And so for our listeners, I would just love for you to just give us a little bit of your story because you started out as an addiction interventionist and, and you kind of, you shifted pathways. So can you just tell us a little bit about how you started the neuro alignment model? Yeah, you're right. It was a, a course correction in a sense that happened. Uh, one of those pronounced defining moments and it, and it starts to get into the world of woo-woo and a yeah. little bit airy-fairy magical um, but 
but it is my experience. And so you can interpret that any way you want. But I was working and I was helping people with interventions and I had been doing that for a few years and, and, and it was a fascinating business and I actually really enjoyed it. And, and it was great to see people have profound change in their life. And I've learned a lot um, and I've actually applied a lot of the pre premises uh, to what I had developed for doing interventions into the work that I do therapeutically with my counseling clients. But <clears throat> interestingly enough, you know, there's, there's also sort of an embarrassing side to the story, not necessarily for me, but I worked in a treatment program and I'm not going to name names, but I worked in a treatment program as an intake counselor initially. And, and I, that's not why I went there. I actually, I went to work there because I thought I would be an excellent interventionist. And that was my intention. And so after I was there about a month or so, I went to the boss and I said, okay, I'm ready to get trained. Let's do this. I'm, I've got a feel for it. I've got the lingo. Um, what do we do? And he literally sat me down at his desk and he explained briefly how to call the client, um, how to get the family to write letters, and then uh, how to take them instantly to a treatment program. And, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you he spent less than five minutes in telling me how to do an intervention. There was no training. He said, oh here's what gosh. you do. He gave, me, he gave me my first phone number. <laughs> now, if I'm being honest, I actually think he was trying to sabotage me because I don't know too many people that would have had the confidence and I'm not trying to toot my own horn or the arrogance um, to feel like they could go and help somebody save their lives. Yeah. Based on that five minute little. So I, obviously what I did is I kind of went home. I told Stacey, my wife, and I said, <clears throat> this is clearly insufficient information and I don't agree with it. It's all about coercion and shame and uh, sort of, threats and bullying tactics to get people to do something which isn't intrinsic motivation it doesn't really compel them and maybe yeah um it might over time sort of change their mind and so what i did is i spent the next few days um incorporating what i knew about human behavior see i'd been a salesman my whole life and sales really is about influencing people yeah and interventions is about influencing people. And so I sort of blended my spiritual teachings that I had many, many books that I had read and been practicing. And I combined it with my sales techniques and I came up with my own model. And I don't have time to describe what that model is, but it was a model based on understanding, compassion, trust, love, accountability, and then hope. And my first 13 interventions were successful. And so flash forward uh, several years as I was doing this and, and uh, fully immersed in that business, I was actually in the middle of a meditation. And in the middle of this meditation, almost exactly eight and a half minutes into the meditation, I, I can only describe the experience because again, it starts to make you sound a little bit kooky. You know, if I was a Christian, if I was a Christian, they would have said that I was full of the Holy Ghost. Okay. If I was, I don't know, but, but. I had some sort of a download experience that in, in a singular moment, my hair stood up on my arms and the back of my neck. I was just vibrating and tingling. I was so full of bliss and joy um, that, that tears started pouring out of my eyes. And then laughter in conjunction with this overwhelming change in my body where any sort of ache or pain that, that, I had even ignored and didn't even recognize that I had anymore, disappeared. And so I was in this pure state of bliss, nirvana. And in this, in this space or whatever it was, I have what I describe as a remembering. And some people would call it a download or a profound epiphany or an awakening, or I don't know what to call it, but it felt most like a remembering. It almost felt like the information that I was being given, and I'll describe that in a second, was something that I already knew, yeah. which then alluded to me to the potential for a higher self, because that higher self was what knew it. Todd never knew it. This was way beyond my brain, way beyond my memory, way beyond my intellect. And, and so I, I, I just, um, you know, ever since then, obviously, you know, trying to 
rationally um, wrap my head around what that experience was. Um, I, I still don't have a clear definition, but nonetheless, in, the, in a single moment that maybe continued for, I would say, five to 10 seconds, it wasn't long. I had this sublime, comprehensive, overwhelming sort of knowing of where literally all human suffering came from and mm -hmm. what to do about it and what to name it. And very specifically in this download, in this remembering, was the message, do not give God credit. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, and so, <laughs> and so I, 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 I ran and grabbed my journal. And as soon as I put pen to paper, literally this sublime, completely comprehensive understanding, the moment my pen touched the page started to disappear. The yeah. periphery, the, the little things that tied it all together, the things that made it sort of unified, started truncating and falling away. And, and what I was left with was the sort of core seminal ideas. But, but, but so much of the detail was gone. And I, I, I would speed up my writing and just try and get more down because I felt like, oh my God, I'm going to lose all of this because I knew it wasn't mine. It wasn't from my brain. It wasn't in my memory. It, it was coming from somewhere else. I think, by the way, let's qualify that. Yeah. I think it was coming from somewhere else. Um, who knows how the brain works exactly or the mind. And so, and so what I was left with was still something very profound. And, and so now I'm going to simplify um, the core message that I was left with because it was so much more complex than this. But, and, and in the simplest terms, what it really said was that all human suffering is either created by, in a modern era, either created by or exacerbated, intensified, or driven by our own internal addiction to pain. And that's it. In a nutshell, it, it, it's so much more complex than that. But if you were just going to walk away with that and had the courage to have the experience that I had, and just believe that and then apply it to yourself and not make it about drug addiction or gambling or sex addiction or whatever, but just addiction to the pain. Mm. That then the chaos, the stress, the drama, the emotions, that all of these things that lead to disease and mental illness and the, and the, the meditation was saying all of this is either created by or driven by this process that's big <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna unpack I mean, this i mean it's huge we're gonna unpack yeah. a little bit <laughs> was, yeah we we, yeah. We, ha we could probably spend days on it and i've i've been lucky enough i've worked so much with todd that i've been able to get a really good understanding of what he's talking about so we're going to do our best to try and give you guys you listeners a, a, a good understanding, a good grasp on what he's talking about here. Uh, I would like to first just comment, Todd, that I do a lot of these interviews over the last couple of years, and I've had the privilege of speaking to some really incredible spiritual teachers. And what's interesting is there's a common thread amongst all of them, and, and include, I'm going to put myself in there because it's happened to me numerous times, is the download if you want to call it from somewhere else or for right. information yeah. as to where, what to yeah. deliver to people. I've had some of my biggest aha moments and my biggest epiphanies coming from somewhere else. And like you say, who knows, is it God? Is it, is it the mother? Is it, you know, God? Right. who knows? I don't like to put a label on it. Right. Is it source. Is it quantum physics? Is it whatever? But it's so clear when it happens. And I think that right. a lot of people will be able to relate to that if they can think of even just intuition sometimes. Like what happened to Todd is probably on a lot bigger scale than what normally happens. But your intuition is very similar where you just suddenly know something and it just pops into yeah. your head. That's kind of a, an easy way to grasp. And I know that... Yeah with so many big and you you follow people like Wayne Dyer and they say the same thing that it comes from somewhere else it does not come from them yeah 
right? When people are writing yes. books, yeah. it's like somebody's writing it for them and they don't even know where it's coming from because they're in that. Right. Place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to be able to uh, package that and quantify it and tell <laughs> yeah. people what it is, yeah. um, but, but we're not there yet. We're not there. No, we're not. We're, we, as we were discussing before we started here, it will maybe happen one day where people can explain that. But right now, it's you just have to trust that it's coming from a higher place. So let's talk about addiction and specifically because you're, you, when we hear the word addiction, we, of course, everybody thinks automatically to substance abuse, sex, you know, the things that... You, if you ask the majority of people right now, are you an addict? And if they're not addicted to drugs, alcohol, or sex, or shopping, they're going to say, no, I don't have any addiction. Right. right? I remember coming into right. my own therapy with you saying, thinking the same thing. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not an addict. Right. What are you talking about, Todd? Right. So can yeah. you kind of break that down? Why it is that yeah. there's so many levels to addiction when you're talking about it? Yeah, that, absolutely. Look at um, without the clarification or or a new definition of addiction, um, people won't have faith. They won't trust it because they can't believe it. And there is a horrible negative stigma to addiction. And and so you can look at addiction. I mean, I can't change the word. We've tried for years to come up with a better word: mm. habits, patterns, um, uh, learning. You know, that's biochemically reinforced. Like all of those things are true. But the only thing that really describes sort of the pernicious and insidious nature of this process and how it pulls us away from our purpose, it pulls us away from our sense of truth and self, it pulls us away from connection and relationship. And the only word that describes that really inaccurately is addiction. And so what actually, there's a, there's a wide variety of different types of addictions that happen. Um, the, so I'll give you the, the sort of the breakdown of the five different types of addiction, and that's sort of important to know. And when I say addiction, I'm not still meaning metaphor. I'm not saying like addiction. I'm mm -hmm. saying literal biochemical addiction. This just happens to be endogenous, which just means happening inside my body with hormones and chemicals and whatever inside my body, as opposed to something outside my body that I put inside my body. Mm -hmm. This is created inside my body. Powerful chemicals actually... So we'll go over that. The very first addiction that people ever have is what we call source pain addiction, which is emotional addiction. This is the core, the catalyst. This is where it all comes from. And almost all of our dysfunction will be in a, sort of an offshoot, a byproduct of this source pain addiction. Now, I, I, it would take too long for me to really get into the intricacies mm -hmm. of how this works in the brain. And, and it probably might be over the head of some of the listeners, not that they couldn't get it, but just that I wouldn't be good enough at explaining it in time for right. certain types of learners. Okay. And so, and so source pain addiction is in fact emotional addiction. So when we go to simplify it, when we go through a trauma, let's say, for example, we say that the, that the first trauma that we have, and that could even happen in utero, there's, there's something that happens. This is where the creation of the false start of the false self starts. And so we say that with the trauma, there's a fracturing of the psyche. With each subsequent trauma, there's a fracturing of the psyche. And with the, this fracturing, if you can picture, that there's sort of like this, this separating process. And, the, and sometimes what I do is I picture the brain just sort of peeling in half. And that there's this fissure that goes deep. And, and as the brain is peeling in half, that there's two cloves, there's two sides, there's two hemispheres. And and so this isn't accurate. This is a metaphor now. And so one side becomes the false self. And one side becomes the true self. And so we believe everyone is born as their authentic self with their spiritual intention, their, their essence. Or even if you don't believe in that, then you could say at the very least their genetic potential, which then sort of scripts and scribes and, and drives you towards through proclivities and, and, and talents and likes and dislikes that are sort of genetically reinforced still sort of moves you in the direction of you if that makes sense yeah well, and so and so that during this um and, and it gets a little complicated so you can follow up with questions if that makes sense but during this trauma and the fracturing of the psyche um then there's also this creation of what some would call the 
false self or the shadow or the ego, yeah. um, um, we say, we actually call it the addiction persona. And at a very superficial level, the addiction persona for its own survival needs drugs. That's why we call it addiction persona. Now it needs drugs externally, it needs addictive behavior, or it needs drugs internally. And the best way for the addiction persona to get drugs is by creating pain. Quick interruption, ladies. I want to tell you about our upcoming challenges that start January 7th in the On Track program. We begin, first of all, our Make the Change Challenge. And I do this every year because, as we know, we all kind of get into the new year with all these resolutions that we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And very rarely do they actually come to fruition. So in this program, I'm going to teach you my step-by-step proven formula on how how to make permanent changes. And I'll tell you what, ladies, if you can do this program and put yourself through it, you are going to have such a higher success rate when it comes to your weight as well as your health. Because I can tell you all day what to eat, what supplements to take, how much to exercise. But if you aren't making those mental changes as well and getting over some of those those crazy limiting beliefs that you have, it makes it very, very hard to make permanent changes. So if you can get this system, I'll tell you what, you are on your way. All right. So what it coincides with, so we do the make the change challenge as well as we have our four week weight loss challenge that we do every year. And this year's weight loss challenge is based on liver and gallbladder health. So we're doing a four-week low-carb keto-paleo-ish, of course, keto-paleo-ish program that highlights foods that will help to support your liver and your gallbladder. As well, there'll be supplement suggestions and we're going to learn about the liver and gallbladder and what it has to do with weight loss because it has so much to do with weight loss and it's something that you really, really need to address because living in this toxic world, we usually all have some degree of liver toxicity, if not a lot. So you can join the challenge before January 7th because registration will close for this and will close for the On Track program. So the On Track program is an ongoing membership for women, but we do close it down during our challenges. So if you are wanting to take part of this, it is free. Both challenges are free with your membership and memberships start at $25 a month. So go check it out, karenmartell.com forward slash on track. And I hope to see you there. Now back to our show. So by creating stress, by creating fear, by creating so on and so forth is how it gets the most payoff and so I'll, I'll need to sort of explain that a little bit um yeah because you're when you're if, saying payoff come... it's yeah it's the <clears throat> okay so because drugs have a chemical addiction but they're also releasing certain hormones in your brain that are very addictive stress right and ego and these things that you're talking about pain will also release those same chemicals right. correct you got it. Okay. That's correct. That is correct. Okay. So let's say if we go back to the first addiction, what we'll talk about is the emotion. So let's say somebody gets physically or sexually abused as a child. Okay. <clears throat> Out of the 212 emotions that they could respond with or feel, it's kind of an arbitrary process how we respond to those types of traumas um, based on circumstance and location and the perpetrator and the way we've been modeling condition to that point. All of those are variables that will determine but out of the 212 emotions that I could choose, and typically people experience, and choose is a bad word, but, but, but that happened to me or that I feel, normally they'll feel two or three or four different emotions. So it depends from person to a person. But let's say at the very least, oftentimes during and or after a sexual abuse, we'll feel some, some sort of shame. We'll feel some sense of powerlessness maybe. And then maybe I feel some sort of, 
unlovable, or maybe instead I feel rage or anger. I mean, it, it could be different, but what ends up happening is if the person doesn't have what we call an authentic attachment during or after the trauma, then they'll actually become addicted to these emotions. If instead some authentic attachment happens, some beautiful healing connection that makes them feel safe and brings them closer to truth and they still feel not at fault or not shamed and, and that they love themselves and they have a complete understanding, then what will happen is that this trauma won't end up being a bad thing. It's still bad on face value if you want to, if you want to, you know, qualify mm -hmm. things in that regard. But, but in terms of the person's life experience moving forward, this trauma for that person who had an authentic attachment, in fact, will create resilience, will create coping mechanisms, will create a sense of alignment with something powerful and positive will create a survivor mentality that this person will um, be able to use again and again and again. And so in that regard, if we survive a, a trauma with an authentic attachment, a complete authentic attachment, it ends up enhancing our life experience. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes the poignant moment in every person's life is these moments, whether or not we're going to have an opportunity for an authentic attachment or an addictive attachment during or after our trauma. And so this is where the first addiction starts then. If we have an addictive attachment, let me give you a scenario. Yeah. Let's say, for example, I worked with the Mount Curry uh, First Nation Reserve up, up near Whistler. And I did a, a two-day workshop. And at the end of that workshop, <clears throat> six or seven ladies came up to me and they said, we really enjoyed your workshop. And we all got together because we're a little bit concerned and we have a couple questions for you. And, and it was very sincere and, and they were very open. And the, the first thing is, before they asked the question, is that they just wanted to say, every girl historically and to date on that particular reservation over the age of six had been sexually abused. Oh my God. There, has not, there had not been an exception to the rule in any wow. of their memories. So it was the norm, and it was across the board. All of them, without exception, had been sexually abused. And so after they said that to me, and of course I started to tear up because I'm looking at them, and the, yeah. I'm looking at the victims of, of, of this horrific act. And then, and then it broke my heart because they asked me a question that said some version of, and that's, that's not okay, right? Like that's, that's wrong, isn't it? And it doesn't sound like much, but what she was saying to me is that they didn't even know wow. that that was so toxic and egregious and you know, reprehensible, like mm -hmm. just so poisonous to them, to their culture, to them individually. Um, and so could you imagine now being one of these children, one of these girls, and so then they would go on to tell me that because there was so much poverty on the reserve, that typically kid, the children would sleep two or three children to a bed. And so, again, I'm not making this up. This is just me recounting. So I don't want anyone to feel offended by what I'm saying. I'm just telling the story of how it was told to me. And then what would happen is there would be a big party. And these parties happened regularly. And the party would be a two or three day party. And as the children would go to bed on day two or night two or something like that, inevitably, it seemed like somebody was going to come in and take advantage. And maybe the, the older sister was 11 and then the younger, another sister was eight and then the, the youngest sister was six. Well, the 11-year-old daughter had been being sexually abused for so long that she would sleep in up against the wall. And the, the eight-year-old daughter would sleep in the middle of the bed and they would put the six-year-old on the edge of the bed which of course is tragic and sad oh, and, and, yeah. and there's no, no judgment there. Yeah. You just want the pain to stop and you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. Anyways, you can't protect them. And so you offer them up yeah. to protect yourself. Protect yourself. Yep. Yeah. Looked around and mom and dad weren't there and, 
granny wasn't there and nobody was there to protect her. And so here we are in this trauma and we're, we're hoping for an opportunity for an authentic attachment, but there's none around. No. So I see a bottle of whiskey on the cupboard and I just, I'm, I'm only eight or whatever at the time. And I grab the whiskey and I just walk down the old dirt road and I get smashed. Now it's not the whiskey itself that's addictive, even though it is, but it's not relevant in terms of how the brain operates <clears throat> or marginally relevant. <clears throat> Instead, whatever it is when I'm in that severe of a trauma, whatever it is that somehow circumstantially happens to be the thing that then pulls me out of my pain, pulls me out of survival mode, yeah. pulls me out of my trauma. Well, the brain sees that as pulls me out of survival mode. And whatever pulls me out of survival mode, the brain better pay, pay, pay attention to. <clears throat> and so and then the brain goes, oh, this whiskey made me forget this trauma. Now I'm laughing and playing in the, in the creek or whatever, or kicking this can, or, and I'm having fun and I've forgotten my pain. And so the brain goes, oh, okay, this whiskey that pulled you out of survival mode, critical for survival. From that moment at eight years of age, anytime I get stressed, anytime I get threatened, I need whiskey. And now that can be subverted over time and it can be challenged over time in a variety of ways that are very complicated, but maybe it, whiskey turns into beer or maybe it turns into pot, maybe whatever, but that some sort of substance like that takes me out of survival mode. And now this kid, unless some profound intervention happens, is guaranteed to be an alcoholic or a drug addict. Mm -hmm. It's written on the walls, it's predetermined. There are other things that could happen, like another trauma could happen with a powerful enough authentic attachment that could undo the previous trauma and attachment. And that gets a little too complicated, so let's just kind of move past that. But mm -hmm. that's sort of how we heal people. But nonetheless, so that happens to the first child. Now, what are the odds in a modern culture, especially in one like the Mount Curry Indian Reservation, what are the odds for that poor child as we're thinking of judgment because of their addiction now? What are the odds that, that as they got sexually abused and they walked out and there was no one around, but maybe granny showed up and, and protected them and called the police and found the guy and put him in jail and got great therapy and did some sort of a native healing process and did the sweat and then prayed and, did, did, and went through a ceremonial healing to that point where that person felt loved and seen and connected. And, and you know, what, what are the odds that that would have happened perfectly? Well, very remote. What are the odds that maybe a million monarch butterflies just flew by at the perfect time and distracted her and she looked up the window and saw these millions of butterflies and she chased after them down the road and then they went down to the old stream and she sat by the stream as these butterflies were playing and the fish were jumping and catching the butterflies and then across the stream, oh, there's a unicorn. I mean, it just, it doesn't happen. No. And so... 99 plus percent are now sort of branded with a template with this what we call source pain addiction now not only am i addicted to the alcohol that saved me but i'm addicted to the combination of emotions that i felt as a byproduct of my specific experience so let's say for that little girl it was i don't matter nobody cared Nobody protected me. I don't matter. Maybe it was be afraid of people because even your relatives will hurt you. So people are dangerous. And then maybe it was that I am worthless. And so for each of those very specific emotions, there are also very specific neuropeptides, protein combinations that act like food for your cells and that your cell has a receptor for all 212 different combinations of neuropeptides that are different emotions that we've described that we've been able to identify and that as i get flushed with that trauma and because i didn't have an authentic attachment i had instead an addictive attachment it brands it and locks it in and so then each time i think about the rape each time i talk about the rape each time i remember the rape um i take all of these internal drugs that then compel me to want to take my external drug right and so as my cells replicate and i create sister cells it, it maybe doubles the amount of receptor sites for those three emotional states until literally every cell in my body is craving, is calling out for, please mm -hmm. give me more feelings of worthlessness. 
Mm -hmm. Please give me more feelings of I'm not loved. Give me, and it's, a, it's an unconscious cellular thing. The cell doesn't know it's good or bad. It just has receptors. And so they must be fed. It's like food. And so there's a consciousness that we call emotion that then compels me through action and thought towards behaviors unconsciously that I'm not aware will actually bring me back to those feelings, but that will inexorably lead me back again and again and again so that I can experience those three emotions over and over and over and over. Yeah. And when you, a person tries to break free and tries to heal themselves, so I'm going to just give the example, of course, of somebody that's trying to lose weight because this is something I see often. As they get, that they start losing the weight, there comes a point where a lot of women, it's like they, it's like they panic almost, mm -hmm. right? And they start to self-sabotage because it's so unfamiliar to them. And I think that it's also that they're moving away from those addictive emotions that they have around their body. Yeah. And when the body is so used to it is addicted to the emotions, it considers it a threat to its survival when it's moving away from it. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, that's very good, Karen. Absolutely what I feel like is happening. And, you know, the, the challenges, and so we can get kind of more into the details of this, but let's say, for example, at the root cause of your weight gain is this, these original early traumas that I'm trying to protect myself from the memory of, from the experience of, from the repetition compulsion, from somehow my recognition that I seem to be unconsciously recreating things that make me feel like this again and again. Yeah. And so, and so if those types of things happen to me, one of my responses might be that my body just creates tons of cortisol, tons of stress hormones as the stress response or the survival mechanisms get activated. And those higher levels of cortisol instantly start packing fat on my body. You'll know if you have super high levels of cortisol because for those types of people, oftentimes it will pack fat on my stomach. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you might not even be apparently and obviously self-sabotaging. You may have just so fundamentally changed your body's physiology because you haven't faced your fear. You haven't resolved the core addiction that no matter what you do, you're eating perfectly, you're exercising more than anyone should have to, you work all day long, you're active as a mother, you clean the house, you this and that, and somehow still you, you lost two pounds this week or, or two pounds this month, but mm -hmm. then you put four pounds back on next month. Yeah. And this impossible struggle and, and for people that are having that type of weight loss problem, yeah, we got to break it down in levels because you're right. Some people self-sabotage and that might not be a fair representation because is it really self-sabotage if the survival centers of your brain have tricked you into a, a self-defeating behavior, but that would be more not you sabotaging you, right. but your, your addiction sabotaging you, yeah. if that makes sense? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And so first you want to be fair to yourself. Yeah. If you understood that there's this very complex and powerful physiological process that's tricking you into whatever looks like self-sabotage. Well, here's the irony. When you self-sabotage, is what you're feeling guilt and shame? And is guilt and shame because of your self-sabotage? Are those also two of the core emotions you felt because of your childhood trauma, your original source pain addiction? And so, and so you failing or your judgment of your failure is the perfect opportunity to trick you back into the same emotions you felt during your sexual trauma or whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. See that the, the trauma doesn't have to be the same, not even no. close. No. Your addiction persona doesn't care. For some people, it will repeat the same trauma again. I'm going up with another abusive man. I'm going up with another abusive man. I'm going up with another abusive man. Oh God, all men are abusive. Yeah. Or, it's completely different. No, nope, I picked a different guy. I'm in a good relationship now, but problems at work, guilt, shame. No, nope, not work. It's like my health keeps failing, guilt, shame, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. 
whatever tool the addiction can use that's going to be most effective and easiest for it to trick you into the self-sabotage so that you'll end up taking the drug it really wants. It doesn't give two shits that you're overweight or underweight. Yeah. It only cares. And so this is actually one way out, Karen. Knowing this <clears throat> and knowing that what it really, really wants above everything else is the perfectly crafted torture chamber of your most profound and painful childhood trauma. Wow, it wants those three specific or four or two specific mm -hmm. emotions connected to the scariest when you were the most powerless, when you were the most devastated. It wants those three, two, four emotions over and over and over. That's what it wants. That's and, crazy. and what drives that and I may not even want to get into this, <laughs> but what, what drives that is, is this quirk in the brain that during stress or trauma and also during taking of drugs or during feeling our most painful emotions from trauma, that, that, that was previous trauma, it re releases, when the survival centers of the brain are activated, it releases dopamine and beta endorphin and a variety of other things. But the important chemical, really, they're, they're all important, but the most important to understand is what happens with the beta endorphin. And the beta endorphin <clears throat> is, it's almost like, you know, the universe or evolution or God made a mistake because the beta endorphin is the body's primary pleasure chemical. So it's what we what we get fed a doubling dose of if we have great sex or great food or a great party, a great socialization, or I, or I, or I express my artistic creativity or I express my talents and abilities, or I contribute to somebody and help somebody, whatever, all these things that we evolved for that, that serve survival, that enhance survival, um, this beta endorphin would sort of double baseline. And, and so you would go, oh, that's sex. And then boom, double beta endorphin. This is good. Let's do that again. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, that's food. Double beta endorphin. Oh, this is good. Let's do that again. And so there's this biological, physiological sort of reinforcer uh, that sort of is enhancing our survival. But what actually happens is <clears throat> with our trauma is that we get the exact same chemical because it's not only our body's primary pleasure chemical, it's also our body's primary painkiller. Wow. Yeah. And we get not two times like we do for pleasure, but somewhere between five and 10 times for painkilling. Oh my God. So I hope people are really got what he just said. So let me just break it down. He's, and, and this is truth. This is science you get five times more of a chemical payoff of, uh, than you do when you're doing something that is pleasurable. Like he said, like sex, shopping, having, you know, really good experiences where you get that rush, right? You get the same chemical payoff when something trauma, like so traumatic is happening to you. Absolutely. So imagine how much more you think that pleasure stuff is addictive think of how much painful experiences are addictive. Yeah. And it's actually the qualifying part of the definition. We say yeah. you cannot actually be addicted to something until it's creating pain in your life or the life of people that you love or that love you. And then you continue the behavior. So in other words, if I went every, out every night and did heroin, but it didn't upset my wife, it didn't affect my health, I didn't feel hung over the next day, I didn't get fired from my job. I didn't feel, you know, um, embarrassed or, or, or like I was hiding or being sneaky or shameful. If none of that happened, you wouldn't be addicted to it. You wouldn't get addicted to it. We only get addicted when it creates pain and then we continue. Oh, Not wow. that we see the pain that it creates because we think it kills the pain. Right. Not that we can see that the pain is directly related to the, the behavior we think that kills the pain. But it, and it might not be directly, but will always be at least indirectly related very specifically to that behavior. Yeah. And so, and so addiction, what it can do with, with food or with sex or with anything is that it tempts of pleasure or the removal of pain. And it's got you in far enough, just like a mousetrap. And then it 
pulls the trap door. And now, as you start to continually pursue the pleasure that you thought you felt or the pain removal that you experienced, it will keep creating pain that you haven't identified yet. And the pain that it wants, and this is really the most important part of this, the pain that it wants is that core, original, source pain, worst trauma, perfectly crafted torture chamber of that child's nightmare, recreated over and over again, but specifically with the neuropeptides, the emotions. And those emotions that were a part of the scariest, most painful experience of my life trigger the biggest trauma again in the brain, usually even bigger than new subsequent traumas could. And so that's where the repetition compulsion comes in, where the subconscious brain keeps compelling me, whether through thought or through behavior or through the law of attraction to recreate circumstances that will allow me to, even if I don't recreate something similar, allow me to perceive that I might be about to, or that run things through the filter of my thoughts that, that would still allow me to perceive it in a way that I could take those emotions, that I could mm -hmm. take those powerful drugs that I'm addicted to, and then that triggers the release of the heroin. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think it's good to be clear that what he's not saying is that, because I think that somebody could maybe take it this way, is... We're not saying that you're trying to, let's say you were sexually abused. We're not saying you're trying to purposely go out there and recreate that scenario that you want to be abused. That's not what it is. It's just trying to get feelings back of the fear, the unworthiness, whatever the emotions came from it. It's not saying you want to re-experience the actual Yeah, that's abuse. a good point. Yeah. Karen, it's such a good point. And to that end, even more specifically, the conscious brain is going to do everything it can to avoid that. Yeah. In fact, it would be offensive to anybody with depression or, or anxiety mm -hmm. disorders or, or OCD or post-traumatic stress or whatever it might be that you're dealing with that's not just weight-related or, or drug-related. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, it would be offensive to them if you suggested on any level that they were doing this consciously, and they're not. Yeah. Right. The conscious version of them, the last thing they want is to be in the same situation again. It terrified them. It's horrific. It's the last thing they want. But in fact, it's the very thing that their addiction wants. And so you have to realize that well over 90% of your behavior is compulsively and automatically driven by the subconscious. And so raising our awareness bringing the subconscious to conscious awareness is critical because then the rational brain can't even change the processes until it's aware of what's happening. And to do that, first you have to accept the premise that this might be happening. Then you have to have the courage to be willing to look at my, what might be happening. And, and as it relates to you losing weight, I hate to say this. I do because it sounds in a sense like I'm, I'm a defeatist. I'm not. But if you're the type of person who you know you have an active lifestyle. <clears throat> you know you cheat a little bit here and there. And you know your, your, your body's hormones have changed a little bit because your extra adipose tissue is making it more difficult for you to create the hormones that help you burn fat. Yep. All of those things have changed. And you know it's harder for you. The, the more you weigh, the harder it is. You know all that. And in spite of that, you know how little you eat. You know you maybe you got your stomach stapled. You know how much you're exercising. You know how often you cheat. And you know it seems unfair that you should be able to be, you should be consistently losing a little bit since you run around with your kids for six hours a day and you work for four hours a day and you exercise for two hours a day. It's just not fair. But until that person, in spite of all that activity, in spite of all that good eating, until that person faces that fear and heals that source pain addiction and tells a different story with conscious intention, they're not going to lose the weight, Karen. No. And if they do, they're going to gain it back. Right. Yeah. You see, the weight, the weight is there for a purpose. It's there to protect you. It's there because of built-up self-hatred. It's there to, um, because of built-up resentment. It's there uh, to insulate you from fear. And all of these things are powerful emotions and emotional processes that need to be transcended 
processed, worked through, so that then the weight starts to just fall off. Yeah. Is there, do you have any like tools or strategies, just something simple that people could use to just to help identify? Well, we'll just say with health and health issues and weight, let's let's just start with those two things. Is there things that a person could journal or ask themselves in order to get to that for source pain? Yeah, absolutely. So first to find source pain, um, you may not remember your deepest childhood trauma. Maybe it happened when you were two. Maybe it happened in your mother's womb. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But but you can identify it because what will happen is you'll have evidence for it. And so so let's say, for example, if you take a look at the most painful thing that you're experiencing right now, the most painful uh, relationship or, or whatever's happening in your life over the last year, that created the most pain in your life. And then just, just to simplify the process, write down the three most painful but very specific emotions that you were experiencing during this painful experience. And then go back to all of those defining moments, all of the painful experiences, the most painful experiences, especially the ones with patterns. And just go back again and again and again and identify, okay, here's what happened here. And don't roll around in it. Don't re-traumatize yourself. Don't overthink it. Just go back and identify it and, and then try to remember or feel or empathize those three emotions and then write them down. What I will bet you, and this is a shock to people, is that in maybe 90% of the cases, 90% of the memories, the three emotions are going to be the same over and over Aww. and over and over and when they're the same over and over well you just discovered something and it's painful but it's also exciting yeah because you just discovered your source pain addiction now even if you don't know what happened to you to become addicted to those three emotions it doesn't really matter in terms of how to heal or address it sometimes it can really help and you might have to go through the therapeutic process to actually discover that and in a moment we can be set free from these things oftentimes because if we know the the original trauma, uh, it it gets so complicated, but sometimes that, that, that recognition or that acknowledgement or that awareness can be the very thing that, that just sort of sets you free because now it's like, oh, that's why I feel what I do and why I do what I do. I thought I was broken. I thought I was mentally ill. I thought I was just stupid. I thought I was a bunch of things, but this makes perfect sense because my trauma was this, my emotions were that. Okay. This explains everything. Yeah. Yeah. It explains why you've repeated the same things over and over again in your life, why you've attracted these things over and over in your life. I think for me, when I went through this process with you, I spent, you know, full disclosure here, I spent two days, full days from morning till night with Todd going through his system of discovering these source pains. And I definitely, since then, that was probably, oh, I would say eight or nine years ago that we did that, Todd. Yeah, yeah. And since then, I, what, I, what I really got from it was I can take full responsibility now for everything in my life that's happening. Yeah. When something keeps reoccurring that is not meeting, you know, making me go to my higher place or keep growing as a person. If there's something that's stopping me, I can now look at it in that addiction lens and go, okay, why do I keep repeating this? You know, why does this keep coming into my life? The same scenario over and over. And now I know how to identify it when before I wouldn't like I was, it's like I was walking around blind and looking outside myself for the answer. And now if something's going wrong in my life, whether it be circumstantial over and over, whether it be a health problem, I now know where to go to fix it. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's easy. No. <laughs> There's still things I'm working on, trust me, but. Yeah, me too, me too. Yeah, we all always, right? <laughs> Just sec, Todd, you're breaking up here. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, there you sorry. go. That's better. There we go. go. I, I was saying, Say that um, again. yeah, what people can tend to do is if we say the word responsibility, some people interpret that as fault, blame. Right. Right. And so then, then 
especially if they have a guilt addiction, then they'll use that as an excuse to oh, unconsciously again, unconsciously their addiction persona will trick them into going, oh my God, so wait, you, you, you unconsciously created all of this? And yeah. you, you, you hurt your children because of this? You broke, had a divorce because of you? Oh, you should feel shame. And, and what's important to recognize, you have to remember the term unconscious. You have to get, until there's an awareness about it, there was nothing you could do. No. You were powerless. Only the light being shone on it brightly enough, and then your commitment to the process, and then your courage to face terrifying things that feel like a little child still running and hiding from something in the body then you might start really overcoming these things. But it requires, first of all, such self-forgiveness and self-love. And then it requires patience. And then it requires real courage. Can you imagine unconsciously if you had a, a, a story and an identity and a narrative for why your life wasn't working out in relationship or with your body or your health the way that you thought it should. And this story was real to you. It was legitimate because you didn't have this information. And now you know that the story's not really valid anymore. It's yeah. actually the justification and the excuse that the addiction uses to keep tricking you into taking your drugs and to keep feeling, making you feel powerless. And so how do you look in the mirror if you don't understand the concept of unconscious? If, if, if you don't understand that that's not your fault, that's not even your responsibility until you become aware. And even when you become aware we still recognize the intense fear that might crop up that might not make you or give you the ability to instantly sort of tackle these things and overcome them. So the, the, the goal for me initially is to help people identify those three emotions and yeah. then like it was the most toxic black tar heroin that they were going to inject into their vein, never fucking take it again. Yeah. At the cost of, even at the cost of that, maybe I should have felt guilt for that behavior. But until I know I'm not, I'm going to beat my addiction to guilt, I now put down the drug of guilt and I will not use it. And if you're addicted to guilt, just trust me when I tell you if something bad happens or if you have an inappropriate behavior, it's not like all of a sudden you're going to be void of guilt. It's really going to be you trying to process and mitigate and limit the amount of guilt you feel and find the ways to not justify it anymore if yeah. that happens to be the thing you're addicted to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so, I would say that the first step is the awareness yeah. can do so much, just the awareness alone, because then you can slowly work on these things yeah. as you start to identify them. That's right. Absolutely. One after the next. And here's the good news. Once you can call it addiction and recognize it's addiction and you know any addiction can be overcome, and that's an important variable, you have to know you're not powerless against addiction. The brain is changing all the time. And like in a moment you can become addicted, in a moment you can break addiction. Now, that doesn't always happen. It's just, it doesn't always happen yeah. that we become addicted in a moment either. It's just the possibility. There's the possibility of in any singular moment that the truth is powerful enough, it's liberating enough, but the addiction literally dies. And then I never smoke cigarettes again. And then I never stuff my face with cheesecake again, not because I'm trying not to, but because the addiction is dead. Yeah. Yeah. And so I want to leave you with something, Karen. And I know you okay. probably have a couple more questions, but just in the sake of efficiency and time, yep. I'd like to share with your listeners this thing that I call the after, uh, aftercare protocol. Okay. So the first thing I want them to do, of course, is as we've already suggested, is identify the source pain addiction. This is what you have to put down. If you don't take those three drugs, those three emotions, no matter what's happening, your addiction will die. I don't care if it's food. I don't care if it's drugs. I don't care. If it can't take you, trick you into taking that trauma, childhood, torture chamber emotion, which is the only thing your addiction persona wants. It doesn't care about alcohol, doesn't care about heroin, doesn't care about chocolate cake, it doesn't care about anything other than those being used as tools to trick you back to the most painful emotions of your childhood trauma. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yep. Okay. I just want to be really clear about that. 
anyway, so <clears throat> then I developed this five-step protocol. I want to make this clear. And, and if it doesn't make sense, just, just kind of jump in and clarify for me. Okay. So step number one, if, if your addiction has an intention for you, if you don't live with intention, your addiction will create your experience or at least poison your experience. Does that make sense? Yep. So then you must live an intentional life. Mm. And I mean, and it's work by the way, but it's better than suffering. Yeah. And so your intentional life needs to be an all day, every day thing. This needs to be the next pattern, the next practice of your life. Like you practice yoga or exercise or brushing your teeth, setting your intention, conscious intention. What version of me do I want to show up as today? What experience do I want to challenge today? What intention do I create? Do I intend for my day? And so uh, it could be something as simple as I intend to forgive everyone and everything without judgment today. It could be something more complicated that I'm going to ask the question, why did I create this today with everything that happens so I can become more accountable? It, it might be something as simple as I'm going to eat healthy food today. Yeah. So that's step one. Yeah. You set your intention. And by the way, once you start setting your intention, your addiction will become more evident. Because yeah. now that you're actually intentional, it, instead of arbitrarily just trying to screw up your life, it will intentionally try and thwart your intention. Yeah. It's like, oh, so you think you want to do that today, do you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's going to rear know. its ugly head now. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and so... And so um, you, you set that intention, but if you, if you do it casually, if you do it as an afterthought, forget them. Don't even do it. it. Won't work. Setting your intention has got to mean everything for you that day because your day is worth creating the way you want it to create. Yeah. And so you set that intention with meaning and you attach it to the emotion that will inspire you to follow through on that intention today. Right. Now, step, it's so important. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> step two is you identify how addiction is trying to thwart your intention. You might not be able to see it directly related to screwing up your intentions, but then you identify how is addiction tr trying to influence my day to sabotage my day, to hurt me or my family today? Or specifically, how is it tr trying to sabotage my intention, my conscious intention? And so here's an example of that. Maybe I have an eating disorder and my intention today was to eat 3,000 calories because I've got to gain weight and I know I do. I might eat 3,000 calories today. So I'm carrying two avocados in my purse and I've got a, a protein bar and blah, 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 right? And I, I'm planning my meals and I'm whatever. So I'm committed to this. And, and so I set my intention, but as I'm walking along, get out of my car and I'm walking along the street towards work, I'm looking in the, in the plate glass windows of the stores next to me and I can see my reflection. And so my internal voice that I think is just my internal voice, but if it's a, a voice that trying to create pain and trying to trick you into negative emotions or negative behaviors, that's not your voice. That's your addiction voice. Mm. And so your addiction voice is going to lie to you because it never tells the truth. At least it never tells the truth or the whole truth. Sometimes it might say something that you believe, like, wow, your hair is messy. <laughs> but, but what it really means is you're worthless. Ah, uh, Right. Not your hair is messy so that you shouldn't fix your hair. No, fix your hair, but your hair is messy. But do you feel these feelings when I say your hair is messy? You pathetic, worthless piece of shit. Yeah. You're disgusting and gross and ugly. That's what it means. So, so you identify what process it's using. Okay, so this girl's walking to work and, it, and, it, and she sees a distorted body and, and, and the voice that comes with it is, uh, oh, hey, your clothes look, look really tight. 
fitting today. So that is, that's its subtle little manipulation. And maybe your clothes are tight, so it might be connected to a thread of truth. But what's it? So that's step two is to identify what process is addiction using. And then step three is to identify what's addiction's intention. Oh, it wants me to feel worthless. Oh, it wants me to feel guilty. Oh, it wants me to starve myself. It's telling me not that my clothes look fat. It's, I mean, not that my clothes look tight. It's telling me that I look fat. I need to stop eating. It doesn't want me to eat. Ah, I happen to know that that's already my problem. I've identified that. Okay, screw you, addiction. And so in that moment, we take step number four. So I've identified addiction's intention. And then step number four is the only thing that will save us. Because knowing all of this is great, but now it's the doing. And so we say massive action in the healthy opposite direction. So I'm always prepared that addiction is going to try and thwart my intention. So I come prepared. And so I'm bringing my chocolate bar and my banana and my, and my avocado and my whatever. And I'm going to eat to the calories that, that addiction doesn't want me to. So it's saying I look fat and normally I would starve myself or go work out. Instead, you bastard addiction. I'm, I'm eating a whole avocado right now to show you. Take this. Who's the boss? Yeah. Take this. That's exactly what you didn't want. And so I'm always going to do the healthy version of the opposite of what you're trying to get me to do. And even if I don't know what to do today, by doing the healthy version of the opposite of what you want me to do, I'll be doing the most healthy healing thing that I could do that day. Hey, addiction, thank you for guiding me so clearly and succinctly towards the best, healthiest healing version of me. And then step number five is at the end of the day, I will reflect upon my day and I will give myself a score out of 100 so that we can start to measure the influence that addiction has. We can start to measure the control and influence we have over addiction and we can start committing to increasing our numbers, getting better and better. Yeah. Oh, that's good, Todd. I'm, I'm already thinking of all the things right now that I could be putting through this process. <laughs> it was a good refresher for me. I love it. Good. <laughs> yes. And so if people are like, give me more, Todd, where can they find you? Well, you can go to neuroalignmentmodel.com. You can also, I have a new book coming out, which will be my neuroalignment model workbook, which will have a lot of these types of exercises in it. Yeah, that'll be great. You can also purchase the original books that I co-authored with neuroscientist John Montgomery, but you can look me up, Todd Ritchie, that's R-I-T-C-H-E-Y. You can also find that on my website, Neuroalignment Model, but you can also purchase the books on Amazon. Um, and there's and two Facebook. Books. And Facebook, yeah, you can find me on Facebook. I have a, uh, my, just my personal, I have a bunch of videos that I've recorded on Facebook. Yeah. But yeah, you can also training. You can also look up my other website, which is called triluminate.com. That's T R I L L U M I N as in Nancy A T E dot com triluminate. And I also have a bunch of videos on there and we talk a little bit more about theory and things like that. Yeah. And so you'll be able to track me down in any of those ways moving forward. Yeah. I also do I also still do private counseling and I will for about another year until uh, we're building an online um, process where we're going to offer courses for weight loss. We're going to offer courses for eating disorders. We're going to offer courses for depression and anxiety. We're going to offer courses for the transcendent relationship. So those are the first three courses that we're working on. And then we're also working on an artificial intelligence virtual reality application of our proprietary psychoeducational model. Wow. And I, I know that I've, I often look at your Facebook videos. So if you guys are just wanting to get a little bit more from Todd in that sense, then definitely hit his Facebook up. I'll have all the links in the show notes uh, to his Facebook page, to both his websites, and uh, you can go check it out. And like he said, he does do one-on-one -on -one coaching still. So if this is something that you think you'd like to explore with yourself, I highly recommend it. It was, like I said, very, very transformational and pivotal in my own healing journey. So 
um, I definitely recommend it. So thank you, my friend, for coming and talking to my people today. My infinite pleasure. I thank you so much for the invite. All right, Todd. We'll see you again. All right. Have a wonderful day. All right, ladies, that's a wrap. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you want more, be sure to check out karenmartel.com forward slash on track and get started today with my monthly coaching program to help you find your weight loss code. Be sure to leave me a review on iTunes and subscribe to my channel so you never miss an episode. Till next time, ladies, have an awesome week.